guest. Um, this for me is a, a kind of exciting moment. And so I apologize if I do any fanboying during this uh, event, but we're here talking to the great Terry Brooks. Um, and uh, I am not exaggerating to say that I might not be a professional author if not for him. And so uh, I'm pretty excited for this conversation too. Uh, Terry, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, that was a, uh, um, a over the top introduction uh, as to any merits I might have. If I had any positive influence on any other author's life, I consider that a big positive and I don't hear that very often, but thank you. Yeah, it, it honestly, um, talking to you means so much to me because uh, I will tell you a little story that um, when I was a kid, uh, probably around 13 years old, all I read was comic books. And my dad got a little frustrated with that. At first, my parents were like, well, at least he's reading. And then I hit an age where they're like, well, maybe he should be reading books. And so um, my dad uh, went to the library he remembered that I liked reading The Hobbit and he picked a book, a fantasy book at random from the fantasy section. And he came home and I remember distinctly him like throwing it on the bed. And he's like, instead of reading all those comic books, why don't you read this? <laughs> and that book was The Wish Song of Shannara. Wish Song, yeah. Um, I know that you pronounce it incorrectly as Shannara, but we're just gonna talk <laughs> that go for tonight. So the TV uh, people told me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so he, he threw that book on my bed and said, why don't you read this instead? And I did, and I just fell in love with it. Um, and then I remember summer vacation was starting and I told my parents that I did not want to go to camp that year, um, <laughs> because I hated hanging out with other kids <laughs> and, uh, I, they were happy to save the money. And I spent that summer reading Terry Brooks books. I, I read the first series backward. I read um, no. Wish Song Wish and then Elf Stones and then Sword. Um, and then uh, I think Magic Kingdom had just come out in hardcover. So I had like four Terry Brooks books to get me through that one crazy summer. And uh, it changed my life. Um, I have I, to tell you uh, that uh, growing up at the time uh, that I did, uh, which is a slightly before your time, uh, Kids didn't read fantasy because there wasn't any fantasy. You know, there was the Wizard of Oz and the Tarzan books, John Carter of Mars, that sort of thing. But nobody was writing fantasy. Uh, and all kids my age read science fiction. We were reading about spaceships and other worlds and robots and the whole business. We were reading Asimov and, and uh, Heinlein Del Rey. That's what every kid was reading. And I actually didn't get interested at all in fantasy until I read uh, Lord of the Rings. And that's when I thought, well, you know, this is what I really want to write because I've been writing since I was 10. Uh, and uh, I've been written, writing everything else you can imagine uh, because I was, you know, experimenting with what might work, you know, what, what might catch on. And I wasn't finding anything. But uh, when I started working in the, uh, in the fantasy area, it, that was when I really felt like I found the place I should be. So uh, I came to it in a kind of an odd way also. I, uh, I had that in my list of questions. Like in your, in your writer bios um, on those early books, it always says like a writer since high school, a writer since high school. But I did the math. Uh, if you, you were born in 44. It's true. And uh, sort of uh, Shannara came out in 77. So it was way after high school. So like I was very inspired by that quote in your bio and I wrote my first book in high school. Um, it was terrible, but I did it, <laughs> you know, like, first I, I, wrote, I wrote a really, really terrible book in high school. The question is, what was it, what were you writing in high school if it was prior to your wow. discovering fantasy? Yeah, I, I you know, I started writing uh, in the fourth grade, um, and I can even I even have my first story, which I won't read to you, but I'll tell you, uh, it's reminiscent of what you just said about your first effort. Uh, but my teacher thought it was terrific, uh, fourth grade teacher, and she gave me an A and uh, a lot of positive reinforcement. Um, and in those days, that, uh, the, that's when I started with science fiction, was right around that time, and I read it all the way through middle grade until I got to high school, and then I shifted over 
to the European adventure story writers. That was mm. the thing that caught my attention next. So I was reading Alexander Dumas and Walter Scott and all of those writers who were working in that, what, the 18th century, set in the 19th century uh, writing area. Uh, and all of it was historical, historically based at least, but it was, you know, fast paced, a lot of action, things going on. And I really loved those stories. And that's- Fantasy adjacent. And, and, and yeah, mm. you know, I did. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't even then, I, I was writing all kinds of weird stuff and I was experimenting with things that I won't even tell you about until I hit college. And then I started writing uh, the great American love story. That's because I was desperate for some kind of love life. Uh, and this was it. <laughs> so I wrote stories. I wrote that typical story, a boy, a dog and a girl, not in that order necessarily, but that was the story. And then we, there was a lot of angst and so on. And my, the writing, uh, the literary magazine of this college I was at actually asked me to please stop sending them my stories. They said, we've seen this. We don't like it. Don't send us any more. Huh. So I started writing a science fiction novel. And I wrote that for a while and I actually almost finished it. Uh, and it was, it was, you know, also a dismal effort, but uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. But then I went to law school after that. These, and yet another mistake, yet another wrong turn in a writer's life, uh, because there's nothing about law school that is conducive to writing uh, anything other than uh, maybe some polemics. And uh, if you're going to be John Grisham, maybe that will help you with that. But I, 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 I hated law school and I was terrible at it. Uh, and I went through the first year and I was, you know, hanging on by my fingernails grade wise and interest wise. And I told my parents, I'm quitting. And they said, no, you're not. You're going to, you started this, you're going to finish it. You're not even paying for it. Get back in there. So I went back and I started the second year. And at that point I said, you know, I have to change the culture that I'm caught up in. So um, I banished television from my life. Um, and I banished most of my social life that was left, which was not very much anyway. Uh, and I started writing this new book that was a decidedly Tolkien-esque fantasy called Sword of Shannara. And I wrote it all the way through law school. And the funny thing was, I tell everybody, then my grades went up. The minute I started that book, uh, they went up. Uh, don't ask me about that. I guess I was in some sort of a better spot. And then I wrote it for three more years afterwards or four more years with several rewrites and other things. And that was kind of how I got started. So that was the first book that you finished? It was. And that I was, was like good late... at starting, not so good at finishing. So in law school was late 60s or so? Yeah, right? I went from 67 to 69, 66 to 69. Right. Yeah. Um, so it took you a while to get published after you finished that book. No, it, yeah, it, 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 the letter, the letter that said we want to publish your book, uh, which came from uh, Lester Del Rey, arrived in 74. I don't remember when now. Um, but then uh, he spent, he, he said, you'll have to first forget this published. Uh, it will be successful, but for you to do this, you're going to have to crawl across uh, broken glass, swim a crocodile infested moat, and I'll be waiting on the other side with a bullwhip. And I said, okay. And he wasn't kidding. So he made me rewrite major sections of that book uh, until he was happy with the way it had it turned out and so forth. Um, and then they spent, uh, he and Judy Lindell Ray spent two years hand selling that book to the book selling community and, and uh, to uh, the public at large we making a big deal out of it because it was going to be their inaugural offering as Delray Books, which was a new imprint. It had taken the place of Ballantine, science fiction, fantasy. This was the new imprint. They were running the show. And in those days, the editors really did run the show. And uh, so they would go to uh, the uh, president of the company, uh, whose name has now escaped me, of course, because uh, I'm old. Uh, and he said, and he, and he always said the same thing, whatever you want. Whatever you say, just do it, which I thought was amazing. I tried that with Lester, and he said, no, you won't. You will do what I tell you to do. <laughs> I 
They said, when you get better at what you're doing, then you can do it the way you want to, but not in the meantime. Uh, I just want to remind everyone who's watching, uh, thank you for being here. Um, you can ask questions in the chat window, uh, either on Facebook or on YouTube, and uh, we'll be collecting those questions. And in a little while, we will uh, answer as many of them as we can get to. Uh, so I just want to let you know now, start thinking of questions or put them in if you have them. And I'll remind you again right before we get to the Q&A section. Um, so I, I have a lot of questions. I mean, I kind of want to just do a deep dive into Delray Books because uh, they're my publisher as well. Yeah, and uh, honestly, when I sold The Warded Man, my first book, um, I had offers from three publishers and they all basically, you know, were willing to match each other financially. And the main reason I will tell you, uh, not to embarrass you, but the main reason that I went with Delray is like, that's who publishes Terry Brooks and I want to be, that's where I want to be. Like, I, I think the majority of the, the book, fantasy books that I'd read were Delray books, like certainly not all of them, but yeah. a lot of them. And um, it just, that was what I wanted to be a part of. Like, that was why I was excited to be a writer when I was younger. And even though there were hundreds of other authors that came along and sort of influenced me along the way, like, my love of fantasy books came from Wish Song. And so uh, getting to be published by Del Rey meant a lot to me. I never, but of course I never met Lester Del Rey or, or you know, sort of the original No, OG they group. were all gone by the early nineties. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I, you know, here's something that's interesting factoid. Everybody I started out with at Del Rey is gone, except for maybe one person. Except for you. Like well, you're, you're, now, you're now the, you, I mean, you were their first book, right? Well, I was the first, yeah, I was. I was the yeah. first one. Um, they were publishing uh, some others too, but it was the first, the first book they did in hardcover and, and the first new book that, uh, that they put out. I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, and it was interesting because when they did it, they had this great big, I mean, I was out, you know, I was out of the cornfields of Illinois. I knew zip about the whole thing. You know, all I knew was someone was going to publish my book. Oh, thank God. That was it. And they had this big party in New York at the Windows on the World in the twin, in the Trade Towers. Yes, it's yeah, true. I remember back it. Back in 75, or, or excuse me, uh, um, 77. And I flew to New York and I just, you know, I went in there and they had this, had they had a whole bunch of author things going around the room, you know, posters and one thing or another. And there I was right up there. And I was sort of, you know, staring bug-eyed at the, all this and what was going on. And uh, I was meeting all these corporate people and so forth. And I thought, I am in so far over my head at this point. I just better shut up and, and let's see what happened. But I met Ben Bova there. Uh, 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 Brian, uh, I can't think of Brian's last name now either. Uh, names are escaping me here. But lots, lots of people that I started out with. And like you, uh, you meet these people along the way. And I remember, I remember your first book very well. And I remember when you and I met for the first time. But uh, I like fanboyed all over you. <laughs> you know, it could have been worse. You could have said, you know, that book almost ruined my life. Uh, but you didn't say that. But the editor, I, you, know, the editor. you think about all the writers you've run into over the years and how everybody in, in this business, everybody is a possible influence in your writing life. Because you don't read for a publisher or you don't, you know, only pick up books from, you pick up books that you think are going to be interesting and you take something away with you if you're lucky by the end of the, reading that book and every little bit that you do of that influences your life. Yeah, I have a lot like of debts to a lot of people. <laughs> Sometimes I'll, I'll read through my books and I'll, I'll see little things and remember where I stole them from. Yeah. <laughs> and like, wonder if anyone else can ever guess like where I sold this from or that from. Um, I, I remember meeting you and it was sort of the same moment where I had just sold The Warded Man. Right. It was nowhere near getting published. And my editor was like, come on, we were at Comic-Con. And she was like, come on, I'm going to introduce you to Terry. And like, you can ask him if he'll read your book and, and make a <laughs> blurb it for you. And she came up and, and like, all I did was want to get my book signed. <laughs> and like, like, I was so excited to meet you that like, you know, the idea of acting like you were like, that we were just two professionals talking about writing, just like, well, was too much for me at the moment. You know, 
and here we are all these years later. I remember uh, being taken to uh, some events early in, in uh, there were like writing conferences and one thing or another with Judy Lynn and Lester. And that's where I met uh, Fred Pohl, Isaac Asimov, all these legendary science fiction writers. And his favorite, uh, I think their fa both their favorites was Anne McCaffrey. Um, and I can remember sitting at dinner with them and watching them knock back such uh, shots of whiskey till I thought I was going to fall over. And, and it was just, you know, it was amazing because it was so, it was so, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it, it was surreal, really, in many ways. Um, I kept wanting to ask questions about their books, but of course, they don't want to answer any questions about their books. They wanted to talk about something else entirely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird. Uh how that is like when you want to just talk about the work um but it almost feels awkward and unprofessional to talk about the work when you're when you're finally off duty um it does. yeah what's think about think about my own work right now when you say that and this being the last genre book uh, i you know i look i think back to the older genre shannara books now i'm saying shannara <laughs> um it is when, when i when I think of those older books, like I can remember like, where I was when I read them, you know, they sort of like, they, beca they became these sort of touch points in my life where like you consistently delivered one a year, right around the time when school started. So I knew like if I went to, to Walden books or whatever around uh, September, there would be a new uh, Terry yeah. Brooks book out. And I remember like carrying Drude of Shinar around my high school and like sneaking pages in when I was supposed to be listening to a lecture. I remember like sitting in the quad at college, sunning myself and reading Tangle Box. You know, like yeah. I think of the books and they trigger like, you know, the Elf Queen of Shinar, like I read it on a ski trip. Do you, do you think of those old books and do they trigger memories for you? of like they, where you were in your life yes. at the time? Uh, not so much about where I was in my life. Uh, the funny thing is, is that after a while, it just all runs together. And I forget uh, where I was, what was happening in my life. If I look at the year and, and look at where I was with my life, I can kind of remember something like that. But what I do remember is the influences on certain things. A lot of this, a lot of what I wrote about was influenced by trips I was on or places I went to, like in Canada, uh, like over to Japan, um, things, things of that sort that, uh, and the British Isles, you know, those things trigger something that I put into the writing because I was so impressed by what I saw, I thought I have to use this. You know, I have to use a locale or I have to use what it's inspiring in me right now. That's what I actually remember. Um, but uh, I, I'm having a lot of trouble these days uh, remembering specific plot lines. Uh, and mm. and uh, when some 10-year-old uh, or whatever comes up and says, now, when you wrote Heritage of Shannara, uh, the Elf Queen, uh, you said on page 435, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, for Christ's sake, uh, because, of course, I don't remember half the... And page, page numbers are meaningless because yeah, meaningless. it changes exactly. from, from edition to edition. I, I can't, all I know is I quit doing the big books after Wish Song. That was the last big book I did for, well, I think maybe ever. Uh, and I went down to four and 500 pages thinking that was sufficient for what was going on. Wish Song I, was, was noticeably bigger than? Well, the others were running uh, six and 700 pages, that sort of mm. thing. I remember having a, a discussion with uh, a writer who I shall not name, uh, uh, not because it's bad, but just because. Uh, and he was telling me about the importance of writing big books. And I said to him, uh, but uh, you still get the same retail price on this book, right? He said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm 300 pages ahead of you and I get the same price that you're getting on this monster book. And it doesn't hurt people if it falls on their face either. Uh, so why are you putting yourself out like this? Why don't you learn to scale back? Less is sometimes more kind of thing. But, you know, nobody believes that. So just me. I, I was talking to Brent Weeks uh, like years oh, ago. Right. And, he, yeah. and he said he said that he met you and, and and you put your hand on his shoulder and you just said, Brent, shorter books. <laughs> I did say that. And and that really stuck with him. But but, you know, when you write epic fantasy, sometimes like you just you get so accustomed to sprawling out that it's hard to, to scale back. 
my the current book that I'm working on right now was sold at 120,000 words. So mm -hmm. I could have fulfilled my contract with 120,000 words, but instead uh, the book ended up being almost twice that. Um, but it was it was the size that it needed to be. You know, um, sometimes well, you can control it, that. You can't just say you can't make all your books be cookie cutter, can you? You can't say, oh, it's going to be this many words, going to be this many pages. Uh, it's going to have this many chapters. Uh, for a long time, I was very structured in my writing. You know, I had so many chapters. I plotted them all out. I knew what I was going to do. I knew all the characters. And then I would make changes along the way because that's the way writing works. But these days, in the last, I don't know, at least the last dozen years, I've gone to a less uh, structured approach to writing. Uh, so what I'm doing now is I have a be I have a beginning and an end right away. I know what the beginning should be. I know what the ending should be. I know who the main characters should be, and you know I want I particularly I know what their flaws are. I know what's going they're going to struggle with all through the book. But beyond that, I sort of work in a more organic fashion than I used to, and I think it's because I've kind of learned to trust the process. Uh, and 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 after a while, it's like any other craft. It just happens uh, in an organic way if you let it happen and you pay attention to what you're doing and you think about what's logically the next thing that might happen in a story. And, and that works for me pretty darn well. And just recently, when I was trapped, as you are, by COVID, I wrote a complete book in four months. What? It's true. It's unheard of. But I did. And I did one of those things where I wrote the first sentence out and looked at it. I wrote and I rewrote the sentence several times, but I wanted that first sentence to say everything and to conjure all the things that the readers would want to know right away to get them involved in the story. And once I'd done that, then I just tore through that book. Of course, I had nothing else to do, so that always helps too. It helps, yeah. You know, but I just did. I sat right down and I wrote the first, I think I wrote the first 10 chapters in about a month. And then I slowed down a little for what came after that. But I just felt like I know this story. I know what it should be. I just got to get to the end of it. And it's got to make, make it work the way it is. But that's a, that's a, it, the rare thing. I don't think that happens very often. I mean, they so, do know all that. So you're saying that you had something of a formula in the early books to I did. help you. Well, I had a formula in the sense that I outlined everything. I was very dogmatic about outlining. This was something that Lester drilled into me after I wrote a bad second book. And he said, you should throw this away now, uh, which was, <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? I just sold millions of copies of Sword. You're telling me this is no good? He says, you understand me perfectly. It's no good. And then he went on to tell me why. And so after that, I got a little bit more structured in the way I put the stories together until after he was gone. I never did anything without a, a, a very firm outline in mind. And that uh, book, that book was Lorelei. Is that what it was yes, called? Yes. Yes. And does it still exist in some fashion? It exists in that I cannibalized the bejesus out of it uh, in uh well, a little in, in Elfstones, but a lot in uh, Wish Song. I just took the things from it that made sense, that I thought were good, and it avoided all the things that he said uh, were not good uh, and made use of it that way. But I, I really rewrote that second book from scratch. Uh, I just figured, you know, if you get little yellow notes in your pages every other page or so through the manuscript, which is what he did, it's perhaps a good idea to move on and let that <laughs> Let that one go. <laughs> uh, I mean, my, my first book, I threw out 60% of it after showing yep. it to some professionals yep. and, and rewrote that section um, from scratch. Uh, like I kept sort of like the core story elements that really worked and then just had to throw out the rest and start over. And I'm so glad that I did. Like it, that's the thing that I think a lot of younger authors aren't ready to hear. You know, that sometimes you have to accept like, okay, like I learned a lot writing this, but it's not my best work and I need to, to put it aside in order to really become who I need to become. It's a hard thing to do to let go of a book. Very hard. I think that uh, there's two, two major lessons. One is that uh, you, have to, you have to get better by doing. You know, you have to learn the craft. And the only way to get that is to do it and do it and do it and do it some more. 
but you will if you're paying attention to what's going on. And if you read a lot, which you really need to do, you will learn from other writers as well as your, what your own intuition will tell you about what you can do and not do. Um, and the other thing is, is that I really believe that when you sit down to write a book, you should decide right away that this is going to be the best book I ever wrote. This is going to be better than anything I've done before. It won't be likely, but you should have that mentality about your books and you should never just, you know, throw something together and, and, and hope for the best. You, you have to, you have to be invested in it. Uh, you have to give it everything you can give and uh, not just do it, make it a throwaway because uh, people will recognize it for what it is. Readers are not stupid. They, they pick up on this sort of thing pretty fast. And they may not think it's your best work, but at least they'll know that you're working hard at it. And I think that's what matters. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, so they want us to take some uh, reader questions, uh, some viewer questions. Uh, so, but first, uh, can you tell us a little bit, have you been reading in quarantine? been reading your own book yeah no actually um, uh, the thing about yes i've been reading quite a bit the thing about uh the thing about uh, the shannara series that i should say something about is that um about two years ago when i finished this book um i had had it pretty much with doing shannara books and i was not going to do any no matter what happened but i have been working towards this ending because it occurs to me as i get older that maybe what I had once thought was true might not be true, and I might not just live forever. So if that happened, I didn't want anybody else to finish this series because I knew what the ending was supposed to be, and I wanted to be the one to write it. So I thought, well, this is as good a time as any. You know, I can write it and finish it, put it aside. Uh, if I decide to come back to it, there's plenty of gaps in, that, in those 3,000 years where I could fill it in with something else. Sure. But I also was ready to write some new stuff and um, write, try, my, try my wings at, at some other flight patterns. Uh, so I, I did. I just I walked away from it and said, this is it. And at the time, I was so happy, I can hardly tell you. Now, of course, I'm starting to think, well, maybe I was a little precipitous about this, you know. Uh, but I figured, well, you know, rock stars and, and movie actors and everybody can come back and start again you know, and say, well, I'm picking up my career again. Guess what? I'm back. Uh, politicians, you know, tell them they Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I don't know. So I'm sorry, what were the, you were going to ask. So you were, you were done, done, but now you're, now you're not so sure. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not so sure, but I think I am pretty sure actually about it. I, I don't, I'm not sitting around here bemoaning the fact that I did it. I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking more about I'm two books ahead of where I was when I said goodbye to Shannara. So I've had time to get over it and, and think about, you know, what do I want to do from here on in? Um, yeah, I, I get that. Uh, having finished one big series and, and kicking off another one that's related to it, uh, there is like this sort of sense of just like, even though you build a world that has a big enough playground for you to write stories forever and never tread the same path twice uh sometimes you want to just get out and do something that's completely different like you still accumulate baggage with each book that goes by um and uh it's nice when you do something new to sort of divest yourself from that and feel free again to just make up whatever i think uh i've 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 been able to do that by moving over into magic kingdom uh and then moving over into word and void and then doing a couple of uh, movie adaptations, things of that sort uh, that gave me a break from, you know, 30 books and however many years, 40 years, I guess, so 40 some years of doing this. I, because your creative muscles, you need to exercise them once in a while and not just, just do the same thing all the time or you, you know, you're gonna get stale. You're, this is, I think, the problem that so many mystery writers run into is that they write the same character over and over and over. And there's a real danger in doing that because unless you don't change ever, you know, your characters have a problem evolving as well. And your enthusiasm for what you're doing is, it can get eroded uh, simply because you feel like you're just treading that same path again. So I, I think I'm, I'm a big believer in you should try something different every so often, even if it's not successful. Is that why you chose to make 
the Shannara books generational yes. and like change the, change the cast with almost every book or with every series as it went on. That was part of it. And the other part of it was uh, I've never been a fan of the same characters coming back and doing uh, extraordinary things over and over. Uh, I've never really bought into that. Uh, I don't believe Tarzan survived uh, after all those things. And, uh, you know, I just felt like, and I've lost interest after doing a, a druid for three books, you know, it's time for them to go away. Uh, so they go away. Uh, but I really kind of think it's more interesting when you're starting things from scratch and particularly when you're developing a whole world and, and social economic uh, you know, background for it, uh, that you need to start fresh and uh, be able to shed everything that went before and say, okay, now we're here. There's some, here's some things that are carrying over, but basically we're going to, we're going to give you a new experience. And then I'm interested. I have to be interested. Yeah. I can't do this if I'm not interested. Yeah, I, I thought that I would, by starting a new series that was in the same world and sort of generational like yours, mm -hmm. I thought that I would be divesting myself of a lot of that baggage. But I found that like a lot of the world building stays, the magic system stays, like so much of it stays that you have to keep adhering to this set of rules that you've made for yourself. Um, but now I've also started writing something that's that's a little new and, and it's you feel so much lighter because you can just Ooh. do whatever. It's, you know, the other thing, Peter, uh, and you've probably noticed this too, is that once you've started something like this, you know, and you're planning on carrying it on for a while, it's great because you know it, but it's also a cage. You can't play outside there. You can't color outside those lines. And once I got 10 and 12 year olds reading these books, all of a sudden, there had to be some limits about what I could write about, as everybody will know what that is. But I can't just suddenly decide, well, this is a great place for a sex scene. I think I'll throw that in. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. If I do that, my editor goes <laughs> right now and I'm out of there. Uh, so uh, you, you do. And, you, and there's, there's other things, too, that, uh, that uh, you get trapped into a corner on. And, and while it's not altogether bad, it, it does, it, again, it's to, it's, you, to some extent, your creativity uh, for what you might do. So that's why you have to do other things that maybe go outside those boundaries. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of reader questions, but before we do that, do you have any books that you've read in the last uh, year that you want to recommend uh, to readers? Well, gosh, uh, Naomi Novik has a new book uh, just out, Deadly Education. Yep. I read that uh, early on. And I was totally blown away by it. Uh, as I describe it to everybody who might be interested, uh, it is Harry Potter on steroids. Uh, and uh, you know, if she if she really let herself go about the magic and how many people would die, that would be this book. Uh, I love this book. Uh, but I, I read a lot of I read a lot of other writers uh, as well, uh, many of whom you would know. Um, I'm trying to think right now. I'm reading a book by a writer I've never heard of named T.J. Klune. And he writes, I believe, yeah, this is young adult fiction, I think. But it's also, it borders on, if it is, it's borders on adult. <coughs> and he's writing something totally different about ostracizing and about marginalizing and about how people who are magical would be treated the same way we are treating people of a different race, different color, different religion, which is something I believe for a long time and I've touched on from time to time. But what he does in this book is truly astounding. Um, I, read, uh, I read a lot of young adult uh, these days because I'm finding an awful lot of good writers working in that field. But you know, I read Brett Weeks, I read uh, Bob Salvatore, I keep my hands in with that. Uh, Piers Anthony, yourself, uh, not Piers Anthony. I don't read Piers Anthony. What am I saying? Uh, you know, I read a lot of Piers Anthony when I was 15. I did. I read all those books. No, Piers, Piers Brown is what I wanted to say. Right. Uh, as well as Naomi, Robin Hobb. Uh, I think, you know, you get something from all those books. They're all wonderful. Uh, they're great writers. They know what they're doing. Um, but I also read outside the field quite a bit. And mm -hmm. I find that this is freeing for me. It also suggests things to me that I don't necessarily find if I'm reading in my own field. Uh, so uh, when a writer comes along that writes something uh, 
uh, truly astounding because they're simply a great writer, that can have as big an impression, impression on you, I think, as reading something in your own field. I still remember a book I read uh, way back when by Nicholas Christopher, and you probably don't even know who Nicholas Christopher is, but he wrote a book called A Trip to the Stars, uh, which was his major book. But the one he wrote before that was called Veronica. And man alive did that book move. It just, it was like you could not put that thing down. And that's what I'm always looking for. And uh, it wasn't even a big book, but uh, the whole thing was that uh, it was a magical book with magical things happening, but it was a nonstop uh, flight uh, all the way through it. Uh, and at the end, uh, well, I won't tell you about the end, but it's, it, it had one of the best endings I've ever seen. You know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the way you feel when you come out of Field of Dreams and a few of those kinds of uh, movies where it's just, oh my God, you know. So I'm always looking for those kinds of things. Uh, you know, um, Alex Harrow, just read mm. Alex Harrow's new book. Oh yeah, that's on my to be read list. I'm it's very different than the first one. The 10,000 Doors of January just blew me away. This new one is, is uh, about the Salem Witch Trials and uh, it's a riff on that with magic involved and these three sisters and this, it, it, she must've put, she put a lot of work into that damn book, I'll tell you, and it shows. Uh, and it, it's a great story, very, very well done. So things like that, uh, I'm reading those kinds of things all the time. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to recommend a couple of things. Um, Good. This year, uh, 2020, uh, because of COVID and, and the shutting down of the bookstores, I think uh, debut authors have been having a bit of a harder time. Uh, I think established authors who already have an audience, like people know where to find them, but some of the new authors who I thought were going to make a big splash kind of um, weren't able to because people couldn't even go to the bookstores. Um, so. I want to recommend uh, Stealing Thunder by Alina Boyden. Um, this is from, it's from Ace Rock, uh, Penguin's imprint. Mm -hmm. um, this book is, uh, has a uh, transgender lead character um, who was a prince and ran away from home to uh, be the person that she always wanted to be and uh, had to give up a lot of power and give up uh, her pet dragon in order to, to do this. And uh, as she gets older, decides to steal it all back. And uh, I could not put this book down. It was amazing. I thought it was going to be a huge splash this year. And uh, I felt really bad that it came out in May when the bookstores were closed. Yeah. Um, and so we couldn't promote it as much as it deserved. Um, so I want to recommend that. What was her also, name? Again? Alina Boyden. Uh, Alina, Alina Boyden. The book Boyden. is called okay. Stealing Thunder. That's my kind of book. I'm going to read it. It's so good. So good. Um, also, uh, I have been a huge fan this year of Evan Winter. Um, this first book, uh, Rage of Dragons, uh, came out last year, I believe, but then the sequel, Fires of Vengeance, is out next month. You, I have very beat up advanced read copies because I took them to the beach, but uh, <laughs> okay. Evan, is a, Evan is a fantastic writer. Like, I was not able to put these books down. Um, I don't know if it is the same for you, but I found that once I started writing professionally, I got a lot more picky about the books that I read and yeah. enjoyed. And it's hard to turn off the internal editor. And so when a book sweeps you away to the point where you stop editing it in your head, that's when you know that you have a real winner. Um, so those are the I think it's the language to a great extent that sets one set of writers apart, the best writers away from the others. The way they use language uh, and imagery, um, the way they say things that make you say, wow, I wish I'd written something like that. That's what I'm always looking for. Yeah, and I've been trying to do a lot of things that are different from what I normally read to, to branch out a bit. Um, I've been doing a lot of audiobooks because uh, when you have small kids in the house, it's easier to <laughs> listen to something when you go out for a walk <laughs> than it is to sit down and read in the house. Yeah. Um, so I just finished Empire of Gold by uh, S.A. Chakraborty. That's also a fantastic series. That was the last book in the series that started with City of Brass. Um, so we're gonna do a couple of questions. Some of these questions we've already touched on uh, in our discussion. Um, Rebecca would like to know, what would you do if you were not writing? Um, it sounds, <laughs> you didn't speak too well of, of uh, law school. Uh, is there anything that you wish you'd done with your life? In the, uh, early, in the early days, Peter, uh, when I quit the law to write, the common 
uh, comment on this was, well, if this doesn't work out, you can always go back to practicing law. And my thought was, why don't I just shoot myself then, right then? Um, so I, I, I expect I would, uh, um, I would probably take a little uh, cup of pencils down in the corner and stand there and sell them because mm -hmm. that's not the only sk other skill I, I might be able to perfect. I, I have no other training. If, if, I, if I don't write, uh, I'm, in, I'm in deep trouble. So uh, After I don't a know. few years as a pro author, you realize you're qualified for nothing else. Uh, <laughs> it's true. I definitely hit that point. When I quit my job um, to write full time, my parents were very upset. They did not have faith in my writing career. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, but I said to them, I was like, look, I don't like my job. I can always get another job that I don't like, yeah. you know? That was, the, that was my rationale is like, it's easy to get a job you don't like. Yeah. Um, and so uh, thankfully it worked out and I didn't have to do that. But uh, I, don't, I, always, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. And I always like my college, I, I majored in English, which is useless for anything other than being a writer. Yeah, um, I, me too. And I got the first like publishing adjacent job that I could get. I started out editing phone books and like, <laughs> went, you know, <laughs> went on into medical publishing, but it was still not what I wanted not to do. Not quite doing. fiction. <laughs> no. Um, so then Alexandria asks, uh, did you always plan to continue Brianne's story or was it partially because fans wanted to see her return? Well, I, I think I mostly continued Brianne's uh, plot line through those nine books because I wanted to know the answer to the question about Grianne, which was uh, how far can you transgress and still find redemption? Um, and without going into any details, the point was that she had transgressed about as far as you can. Uh, and she had killed people uh, knowing what she was doing uh, and do it, did it willingly, even though she was deceived in, in this. So, but she then wanted to gain redemption and she did so by becoming the head of the Druid order and becoming a, a good person who uh, was trying to do the right thing. But not everybody was happy about this. And uh, the fact is, is that at the end of the day, when we ask ourselves about transgression and it, can you get, get forgiveness in the Christian sense, can you get forgiveness? Well, the answer is from some people, sure, not from everybody. That's not going to happen. Uh, and so you have to, you know, you have to say, so what is your logical approach then once you know that you're never going to be entirely forgiven? What do you do? How much of yourself do you give up if the requirement comes around again for you to do something that you wouldn't necessarily do? And that it took me, it, I, I didn't know the answer when I started it out. And after three books, I still didn't know the answer, but I was locked into her because she was now the head of the Druid Order. So three more books to get that settled. And then of course I'd put her in such a bad place that people said, what are you gonna do? When's she gonna get out? Because she was trapped by, in the forbidding, you know, and yeah. I said, oh, for God's sake. So then I, I got her out, you know, and now uh, we are going to finally, in this new book, uh, resolve the, a uh, matter of whatever happens to poor old Grianne Olmsford, who has been through so much. Will she ever find peace? So you have solved the Christian problem of uh, sin and forgiveness, finally? Well, I, 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 I have not solved it, I'll tell you. I, I know where, my, where I now stand on this uh, and uh, how far I'm willing to go to grant uh, uh, forgiveness to people who I think have transgressed. But I'm being tested mightily by this damned election, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I mean, without going into details, the reality of, of dealing with forgiveness right now is, uh, is a daunting one because, you know, you know, like holding a grudge doesn't solve problems. No. But it's hard, but it's hard when you've been hurt to, to sort of let these things go. Um, but really, the only answer is, is moving forward and, and, yes. and you know, cleaning up the mess. Um, and so I think we all, it's, it's on us all to sort of uh, get past a desire for vengeance and focus more on fixing, like putting out all the fires that are yeah. literal and figurative <laughs> that are going off everywhere. Yeah, I just have to, uh, I just have to say that uh, what you say about 
your choices are, is exactly right. And uh, I, I always think of uh, Elwood Dowd in, uh, uh, the, in Harvey. Mm. He said, you can be oh so tough or you can be oh so kind in this world. And, or words to that effect. And he said, I find that being kind is better. And that's kind of the way I feel about it. You just, you, you have to set an example. If you, want the, if you want the world to be a better place, it has to start with you. You have to be a better person. You have to, uh, you have to demonstrate that you're a kind person and that you have a sense of, of kindness in you that can carry on to other things and, and not be somebody who has, is filled with vitriol and a sense of uh, a need to get revenge on somebody or other. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. We'd probably beat that one to death, but there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably for the best we let that go. Um, so Michelle uh, is asking what your feelings are at the ending of the Shannara legacy. You've talked a little bit about that third book and what you have what you wanted to get out of it and what you want to come with it, but how are you feeling overall? I mean, this is 33 books, uh, if we include the graphic novel, right? Yeah, it might be. I've, I've kind of lost track because there's a few scattered odd books uh, or, you know, like graphic novel and, and uh, a couple other things. Um, you know, this book was always about one thing. It was always about magic versus science. The mm -hmm. world of science destroyed, replaced by a world of magic. People had that in their lives for many years, and then they became dissatisfied. We're not happy because it's elitist. We're not happy because we don't have any magic, but, it, but the, it's, it's held by a few people and administered accordingly. Uh, and I see that very much as a reflection of the world. Uh, so at the end of this, the question was, if science creeps back in as it does through these last six books or so, uh, and it becomes clear that it's, it's going to pose a problem for magic and magic is on the wane now because, you know, there's been a lot of dissatisfaction with the Druids, a lot of dissatisfaction with magic wielders and so forth. What do you do when you get to a point where there is a choice to be made? Will we go this way or will we go that way? And the person who in question who maybe can make this choice has to be the one who decides then what? What do you do? How do you reach a, a reconciliation? How should that come across? And I wanted that conveyed in the end of this book that you, we had a sense of this is likely how something like that would go and mm. uh, tell, the, tell that story at the end. And I was pretty happy with the ending. I rewrote, I knew that ending down to who the character was gonna be, uh, what the, where the setting was gonna be, uh, what what the emotion was I wanted to generate in the readers, and I've known it for at least a dozen years or longer. I've, I've always kind of known what that should be. So the trick was to execute it in a way that made sense, and that I, that's what I tried to do. And now I can walk away from it to a certain extent and say, well, that's it, you know, um, and I'll start going out now and recruiting uh, my replacement, and uh, you'll soon see uh, books on the shelf uh, that will be come across as the books I had in the trunk in the attic, but uh, in fact will be written by somebody. And so it will say, just like on many people's writers, presented by Terry Brooks, written by, and so on, and then something Shannon or other. And, and, and it'll, it'll just go on until people just finally storm the publisher's office and demand that it be killed. Forever. Is that really your plan? That's my plan. That's yeah. fantastic. I That's didn't it. know that part. I'll be dead, so I won't care. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, I just think that's, I kind of like that idea. You know, a, a referendum will go forth uh, to demand that there be no more Shannara books for the sake of humanity. Something like that. Did you, but did you personally have, a, like when you finished that final scene and felt like, okay, I executed my vision what did that mean to you in that moment? Like, you know, did you look back at, at, at 40 some years of, of yeah, I did. And, and I did. I felt like, I felt like I spent those years. Well, I felt like I've always felt like I did the best job I could. Um, it's always been true that when people come up and talk about, uh, talk about one book or another, it's never the same book. 
You know, mm. a lot of it is is sword, of course, because that was the first one. And for many people, Elf Stones, because, well, there was a TV show and all this. But they, it, what interests me is how many people come in and say, well, my favorite book was Druid of Shannara. I say, that was the second book in a set. And they say, mm. yeah, no, but still, that was my favorite book. And so I feel like, okay, if there's a, a preponderance of change throughout in terms of how people see these books and what their favorites are, then probably I did about the right thing at the end of the day. So now, you know, I feel like I've done it. I've completed it. I have a sense of, of, of satisfaction in having completed it. I can let it all go. And right now I'm way over there working on something else that I'm just as excited about as I was about the Shannon books. I think that's all you can ask. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think because each book had a different focus character, yeah. uh, it's very easy for people to have their own personal favorites. You know, like uh, when I think of the books, like each one sort of stands out to me as like, who was the main character in that one? And like, how did I feel about them? And so I could see why Druid would be, would have touched a lot of people. I think that that was uh, a really one of my favorite ones as well. Do you, I don't want to ask, uh, so um, one of one of our listeners or readers or watchers or whatever they, uh, Suzanne Stitz was asking, do you have a favorite book in the series? Um, and I know, and she said it as well, like it's sort of like children where it's hard to pick one that's your favorite, but do you, do you remember one as being particularly harder than the others to write or more of a triumph to finish? Well, I obviously Grant Elmsford leaps to mind right away uh, yeah. as somebody that I had a, because obviously if it took nine books to get through this thing, uh, that was difficult. Um, you know, for the most part, I've kind of, at the time I was writing those characters, all of them presented a certain kind of problem. It was not the same problem, but they were never just, you know, lay it down, write it out, it's okay, no problem. There were always things along the way that I stopped to think about doing, or am I doing the right thing here? Because that's kind of the way when you're creating characters, it works. Um, there are always questions about where the, what their role should be and where how, how they should achieve what they're trying to achieve or not. Um, so you, you, you struggle with that all the time. Um, and I'm glad she brought up the children thing because that's my example. I use it all the time. And I get that question. I say the same thing. You're asking me to choose between my children and I won't do it. Yeah, uh, and I totally understand that feeling. I bet you do. Um, <laughs> uh, especially when it's all part of one big project that you've been working on that, that changed your life, really. Oh, you know? absolutely. It's, it's, it, it has defined my life. Yeah. Uh, and that is something I can really understand. And uh, yeah. getting to the end of that, I know is emotional in a lot of ways, some of which you feel right away and some of which you sort of take a while to process. Um, and so I just, I want to congratulate you on a, on a tremendous, amazing achievement that has touched so many lives, mine included. Um, and uh, I think there's a whole generation of writers out there that uh, owe something to you in the same way that you, you know, would say that you know, Alexander Dumas or, or Tolkien or, or other writers influenced you. Like, there are a lot of us out there that, that are here, you know, because we fell in love with Terry Brooks. And so That's a on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you. That's a terrific compliment and I appreciate it. And I have to tell you that the other people, the other people who talk to me this way about their, the importance of the books are, are the readers. And they do so in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's, this book came along at the right time in my life. I needed this to get me away. I was in a bad place. It took me away from that bad place. Or I was going through a situation where somebody was, was dying. And I had to get past it. And this was this is a book that helped me do it. And this is what books mean to you and I too. This is yeah. what they do for us, don't they? Uh, they mean something to us. And I, I think the ones that stick with us that we remember the most are the ones that had the biggest reaction. And for a writer to hear this anytime, anytime at all, it's always a big deal. And if I when I run up against another writer, it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, whose work has meant something to me, I always make sure to tell them this book was really important to me or this series was really important to me and I really enjoyed it. And I'm very happy you wrote it. something along those lines. And that's what, that's what we do this for to a large extent is to make people happy, to make people feel like what they're reading is worthwhile, like they spent their money for a good purpose and that they are taking something away 
from this reading of the book that matters to them. Yeah. I'll get down now for my pulpit, thank you. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, that that's the thing that's most touching uh, in any response you like. When you hear somebody talk about your characters and how they love your characters, it's one thing. But when you hear about how, like, you know, someone writes to me and says, look, I was dealing with chronic pain and you had a character who was dealing with chronic pain and repeating the mantra that they used in their head helped me get through this, you know, chemotherapy or some other difficult time in their life. Like, that's where you're like, I really touched someone and it wasn't, you know, about, you know, my main character saving the world. It was about some little thing in the story that just was there when they needed to read it. Yeah. I mean, I can think of books that I've read at crucial times in my life. I'm sure you can too, where it just impacted you in a way that made a huge difference and brought you back from maybe a kind of a dark spot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're running out of time. Uh, I honestly, I could talk to you all night. And so like, uh, <laughs> I, I hate uh, breaking it off, but um, thank you so much uh, for this conversation, for being here, for, uh, 43 years of amazing books um, and hopefully 43 more to come. Well, uh, I'm on it. Uh, it's really been a genuine pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you so much. And thank you everyone uh, out there who's been watching this uh, or who will watch this later uh, on YouTube. Um, this has uh, been an, an honor for me and uh, I'm so glad that we were able to share it with all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Terry's new book is available uh, at Barnes and Noble. Please uh, pick it up either online or in a physical store. Uh, you have a copy there you can hold up. I don't have one yet. A little further back. The Fall of Shannara uh, there it is. is available, is available uh, at Barnes and Noble uh, online and in stores. Uh, pick it up. Uh, it is the culmination of an amazing achievement um, and absolutely worth your time. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you for taking time to uh, talk with me today, Peter. You and I haven't run into each other for a while, so it's kind of great to be able to renew this friendship, uh, uh, even if we're doing it virtually. The last time, <laughs> the last time we were together was in Denver, and we went to that restaurant where they served, where they had like bugs on the menu. I remember. <laughs> and you were you and you and Jadine were absolutely horrified. We were um, too. I mean, I'm, I, I eat a lot of stuff, but bugs is not on my menu, and I don't care who thinks it's a great idea. I know I David like I never listening. I think this was his idea. I threatened yeah. to get even with him for this. <laughs> it was, I don't know. I, I felt like I'd never been to a place with crickets on the menu. I had to at least eat crickets. <laughs> um, but nice. that was an amazing trip. Um, it was so nice to, to catch up with you then. It's good to talk to you now, and hopefully we won't have to wait a few years for the next time. Yeah, I hope not. And thanks, everybody, for listening.